טוב, אנחנו מתחילים את היום השלישי של כנס השכונה כזירה גלובלית. הצטרפו אלינו היום מרקית סביפין, אני אציג אותם בקצרה בעברית ולאחר מכן השיחה תתנהל באנגלית. אז אם אתם צריכים תרגום סימולטני, נא לקחת אוזניות מאחורה. מרקיצה פוטרק היא אמנית בעלת הכשרה אדריכלית שנולדה בלובליאנה וגרה כיום בברלין. מרקיצה הציגה פרויקטים ועבודות סייט ספציפית בתערוכות בינלאומיות כגון הביאנלה בוונציה, הביאנלה בסאו פאולו ופרויקט הפיסול של מינסטר. היא זוכה מלגת ורליסט לאמנות ופוליטיקה בניו סקול בניו יורק ותערוכות יפית של האוצרים מוזיאון גוגנהיים בברביקן בלונדון ובאפל באמסטרדם. מאז 2011 היא מובילה את הסטודיו Design for the Living World באוניברסיטה לאמנויות בהמבורג, שעל עבודתו של הסטודיו היא תדבר היום. הסטודיו עובד במס... במסורת של שעויות אמן למספר חודשים בכל אתר, והפרויקטים של תלמידי הסטודיו עוקבים אחרי מספר מתודולוגיות שפותחו לאורך השנים בעבודה משותפת עם תושבים. <אח> מצטרף למנטיצה פין ברוגמן, שגדל וחווה באזור הכפר מחוץ לעיר המבורג. הוא מחזיק בתואר ראשון ל-Liberal Arts and College באמסטרדם. הצטרף לסטודיו Design for the Living World מאז 2012, והוא יסיים את לימודיו לתואר שני מהאוניברסיטה לאומנויות בהמבורג בקיץ הקרוב. פין יזם ועבד במספר פרויקטים שונים בעיר המבורג, והיום הוא יספר לנו על פרויקט שפועל בנמל העיר בשם הארכיפל, שהוא פרויקט המבוסס על מחזור של מצופי פלדה מהנמל. והפיכתם למרחב ציבורי חדש על המים בתכנון נטול תוכנית. So, uh, Fien and Manetica, that was uh, both your biographies in Zibru, I hope you got it. Um, please, just feel free to say it. Yes, so um, I'm a student of uh, Manetica's uh, class and I will be talking about Uh, the Archipel uh, project, it's a project I initiated uh, together with uh, two close friends who can't be here at the moment. Um, and it's uh, developed um, separate uh, from the class, but kind of in the same spirit. Um, the Archipel is a collectively built and used space that floats on the waters in Hamburg. And um, me and uh, these two uh, friends, um, we uh, saw the need um, to uh, build an open space that is um, developing uh, without a program, much like this place here. And that's taking place in Hamburg. Um, this is a map of uh, the central area of Hamburg, and as you can see, it's full of waters, full of canals, and um, when we started to think about uh, an open space in Hamburg, we um, talked with the city, and we uh, tried to um, uh, get them to give us a space where we can uh, work together with people, and it was really complicated because either it's very expensive or it's only for short-term uses these spaces. So we decided to uh, move on the water and uh, it's uh, also a long and complicated uh, process to uh, start to uh, do something there. Um, uh, yes. Um, It's a, yeah, it's a complicated legal, legalization um, process, uh, much like cities like Copenhagen and Amsterdam. Um, there's uh, the official city policy is to try to um, make the water spaces usable, but there are uh, big uh, bureaucratic obstacles to actually allow for it to do it. And one of the talks that we had with city officials, um, a guy said that it's uh, very, very expensive. He talked about like millions of euros. Uh, and it's uh, basically impossible. And so we try to find uh, loopholes in this, um, this floating platform that we initiated. We uh, didn't call it, or we couldn't call it a houseboat, but uh, it's now a, a docking, uh, officially a docking station for other boats, which makes it um, more, uh, which made this uh, legalization process more easy for us. 
Um, yes, uh, maybe I can show you uh, first of all to get an impression of uh, what these things are that I'm talking about. A little video of the construction of it. Uh, let me see if I can manage. Yeah, so um, uh, what you saw are these uh, steel pontoons. Um, this is something um, after uh, running around in the harbor and all kinds of scrapyards, looking at old boats and so on. This was uh, the material that we decided for and uh, luckily we were allowed to start building them uh, on them on this um, scrapyard. And besides what you saw with the uh, cleaning and uh, repainting uh, them, we uh, welded these connection parts to it uh, that you can uh, see there. So as you can see in the scheme uh, on the top, you can, they're like Lego blocks that you can um, duck together in different formations. And on the picture to the right, you see that we uh, also welded on it a, a steel uh, skeleton construction that allows uh, for a simple uh, tarp roof or um, uh, hopefully in the future also um, something that is isolated, so uh, it's a place that you can use the whole year round. <coughs> and uh, so this is like the uh, second, uh, second stage of this project after the uh, legalization that we started uh, to build first on the scrapyard and then in the canal where it is uh, still positioned today. And the idea is that um, uh, the place is built together, this comes uh, from kind of the philosophy of the class of a relational object. Uh, we believe that if you're uh, building a place, uh, you start to feel a responsibility for it. And uh, yeah, there are uh, mainly neighbors, uh, friends of friends, of friends uh, that uh, were part of this um, second stage uh, of the project. Then, uh, this is in June uh, of this year, uh, the, I think you call it in English boat uh, christening uh, ceremony, when you hit a bottle of champagne on the boat and you give it a name. Uh, so we called it the archipel, actually the bottle of champagne didn't break, but then Moritz was uh, very fast in throwing a, a bottle of cheap beer against it. And, and then right in that second the band started playing, there was a jazz band who uh, also live in this area. Uh, and uh, for us, this uh, was kind of, uh, oh, yeah, you can actually see uh, Amalia and Nuria, these two ladies that are together with me throwing the bottle. These are the uh, two other co-initiators. So for us, this was kind of uh, the part where uh, our role uh, stopped. So um, we didn't uh, think about, uh, our plan was uh, until here, so there was no other um, program planned. Uh, it's a 
we just wanted to uh, kind of hand over to, let's say, a community that was supposed to reform around it, um, just a space uh, that is floating on the water that you can use for many different <coughs> purposes. Yeah. Like, very much like this place, a place without a program, that then slowly, um, uh, it was just a few months until it got cold, um, uh, some uh, program uh, started to, uh, usage started to happen on it. Uh, for example, there were um, uh, theater performances and music performances also uh, happening uh, on the place. Uh, what you see on the top is a, a theater uh, collective from Hamburg, the Geheimagentur. They um, had an alternative uh, cruising terminal uh, and they made uh, excursions with little boats that you see uh, around the waters and this excursion was a wellness excursion. People were doing yoga on the float. Uh, you see uh, on the bottom, uh, it's like a noise uh, performance of a, a music collective from Hamburg. Uh, there were other uh, music performances from a jazz band. And, uh, on the top, uh, uh, there was a music of like, progressive uh, rock music that was uh, taking place. Um, uh, one lady from the, uh, actually two ladies from the neighborhood uh, offered uh, free uh, or donation-based yoga classes every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, you could just come by and uh, get a yoga lesson in the sun in this uh, really nice atmosphere. Sometimes we also, uh, now the pontons are um, really attached to the Sure, but uh, sometimes we also let them free. So, like while you are moving on the pontoon, the whole pontoon is also moving on the water. There were um, movie screenings. Uh, there was also one guy from the neighborhood that organized these uh, pop-up cinemas in uh, different um, places in Hamburg. Uh, there was a movie screening of a movie that also played in this uh, canal. Um, uh, many times we were uh, cooking on the archipel or like here had more of a picnic uh, and this also came together with uh, like weekly meetings every Thursday um, every people who were interested were invited to come and uh, propose ideas of uh, usages or uh, what else could be built on these uh, pontoons uh, so kind of like a planning uh, meeting that always went along with food. Um, and uh, there's uh, over the summer another uh, float uh, dock to the archipel. And as I said, it's officially it's a dock. And the idea of uh, also what the name suggests, the archipelago, uh, I don't know for those of you maybe who don't know, archipelago is like a chain of uh, small islands. Uh, the idea is that uh, this archipel grows and over the summer it already grew. It's, uh, this float is from the same uh, theater group who were building this float uh, and moved around in the harbor with it to protest for um, the rights of the inhabitants of the city too and the water spaces. And um, we hope uh, uh, next year um, this group will be building another float and uh, I want to initiate building um, another float and um, it's kind of we're trying to find, as I said, these uh, loopholes and the regulations. So since we have uh, a docking, uh, official docking station now, uh, more and more floats can dock to it and kind of make uh, more land to be used uh, what I forgot to mention in the very beginning is that Hamburg is the uh, most expensive city in Germany when it comes to rent prices and so on. So there's really um, a, a need and a, a wish uh, of people for uh, more spaces and alternative spaces that are not um, uh, uh, like, uh, under economical pressures or, so, or that are not like a cafe or something like that. And uh, of course, when you're on the water, you can also move. Uh, there's uh, a really lucky coincidence also that 
another guy that uh, joined the Archipel group uh, that you see there with this big engine. He's um, working in the Mediterranean Sea on a, a boat to um, help out uh, refugees that are fleeing from Syria and he um, got one of the motors from an old uh, refugee boat. Uh, normally these boats are uh, sunk in the Mediterranean Sea but he could manage to rescue one of the motors and he could also manage to bring it to Hamburg. It's a huge engine with uh, 60 horsepower uh, that uh, we have now to use and uh, we used it in the way that we docked it to this other float and we could drag uh, the big uh, pontoons uh, along the canal and uh, also next year we hope to um, have them in different places in Hamburg. Um, yeah, so this is uh, kind of the last part to wrap up. Um, so with this archipel we um, try to create a completely new space and what especially I'm interested in is um, what do people do if there are no, like no one tells them uh, this place is for this or this place is for these kind of people. So what kind of people come? Uh, how can you attract a diverse group of people and how do they then uh, organize amongst themselves uh, for um, uh, things to happen there basically. And we I uh, like the idea of doing this on the water because also from the image it's like a new land uh, with uh, new rules of being together. Um, and it's a process, uh, it's a long uh, process which just started this year, it's uh, open-ended. If at some point there's nobody interested anymore, this will just stop. But as soon, uh, as long as there are people interested in working uh, on the archipel, it will continue and it can grow. And um, what is also important to us is that it's autonomous with um, kind of getting around these uh, regulations. Um, and there are no, like on the land, you have a lot of building regulations. On the water, this doesn't exist. So we've kind of, we have this uh, one step in the door where we have like a, a potential for a very experimental space to develop over the next years. Okay, I think I will hand over the microphone to Maria Pizza, who will talk about the Soviet project. Thank you, Bill. Uh, just need to talk about it. Uh, my pizza is on, but we are talking about it. So, um, uh, as he said, I'll talk about uh, the Soviet project in 2014, this is one year ago. Uh, the class had a residency in Soweto, South Africa, and uh, actually uh, from the group of the students that were there, it's Phil who was also participating. So I hope that she will also have a word to say. Okay, so we actually, the class also made a book, published a book, which is called the Soviet Project, so you can just uh, look at it and pass it around. So, uh, the Sunito project is actually made of two projects and I talk about uh, Ubuntu Park, uh, which is uh, a story about this quite uh, huge public space in the middle of residential area uh, that uh, was, that was uh, uh, a dumping ground for more than 40 years and uh, together with the community, uh, we cleaned it and uh, actually today it's a community organized and maintained public space. Uh, so I'm personally very much interested in this new kind of public space where community can take uh, care and also manage the, the public space. I think it's very important to realize that this is possible, maybe also possible for the 
Digital Art Center campus that we are uh, situated ourselves in. So let me, uh, so uh, again, this space was a dumping ground for 40 years. It is located in the middle of residential area in Soweto, uh, South Africa. Soweto is, uh, used to be suburbia of Johannesburg, but now it's a city of 2.5 million people and it's actually bigger than Johannesburg. Uh, so, uh, who are we? Um, as Kili mentioned, uh, I started to teach at the University of Fine Arts in Hamburg in 2011. Uh, and the class is called Design for the Living World. What you see here is a photo of students and uh, community members that participated in the transformation of the dumping area into Ubuntu Park. And it was our first meeting on the lot. Uh, we, the project is it's like actually interesting how it happened uh, to be. We were invited there uh, for, uh, let's say, for three months, uh, but we stayed and worked there two months and a half, which was amazing. And uh, the, we were invited by a small uh, non-profit art organization from Berlin called Urban Dialogues uh, that received money from some kind of a European cultural institution uh, to fund projects that support long-term exchange of knowledge. And uh, it was exchange of knowledge between five cities in European Union and four cities in South Africa. And people like us who were chosen or invited to do the project, we were expected to be on the location for a long time. So this is exactly in my philosophy, so I thought this was like, super interesting. And uh, for me, it's one of the best projects in my life, but also the class and, of course, myself, we learned a lot. We published a little book, which I just uh, I gave away so we can have a look at it. So, um, what else? Okay, the class, this is actually a slide which I took from the class presentation because we are a part of the design department in uh, the university and it was sort of confusing for students of design department that are focused on product design to understand what we are doing. And so here you can read what we design is a process of working together. So instead of focusing on objects or products, we focus on people and on the process of processes of working together. Um, working together... Um, okay, we have a philosophy that when you talk you achieve something but not much. That really the change in the environment happens when you work on projects together. So that it's a next... Uh, this is a very important step. So. Working together is important. Here you can see uh, the, the Ubuntu part, the future Ubuntu part, and uh, the process of uh, actually mixing cement for the uh, platform which we build together with residents. And also what is also super important in this project, we were very clear from the start, we said to community that engaged around these issues, we said it's not our project, it's your project. So this is like, it's clear from the beginning that we are not caretakers uh, of the project, that they are. Uh, participatory design is uh, not something that is new for anyone here. I think it was, it got a lot of attention in the 60s and then it just uh, dwindled away because of neoliberal uh, development and also social, let's say social and economic agreements. And uh, the, it's actually also not supported by developers today because politicians and developers think that uh, it takes too long time to do it. Um, however, we do think that uh, it's important that uh, communities are involved in bottom-up processes for the, uh, for the future city, idea of the future city. I think this is the passion of all of the class, the participation from below. And uh, the four steps are basically, you know, you have to do research before you go to the location, but then you design and work together with residents to make a project. For me, the fourth step is most important. Uh, it says, 
transferring the responsibility for the developed project to the community in order to leave behind a sustainable work that benefits the community in the long term. So basically what is important is that you at some point become irrelevant and that the uh, community takes it over and uh, this, is, this was the success of the project, we became irrelevant. And I knew it one month before we left Soweto. Uh, I was not organizing any community meetings anymore, but uh, like community, the committee that was elected uh, on the Ubuntu Park, they actually called for the meetings and uh, they asked me to come. So at this point we knew that the project is taking ground. What you are looking at is a, a committee that um, residents voted and uh, they had five groups. One was the most important was security, maintenance, then also urban agriculture, uh, what else? Then the, also the art and culture and something like play, the children's playground. Um, then I'll show you now just quickly uh, new words that we started to work with. And uh, they became very clear uh, exactly during this project. We found out that the new practice also needs new vocabulary. So we started to use words instead of thinking about uh, objects and dimensions and spatial conditions and conditions of the time, we said, okay, it's a relational object, it's performative action, it's a ritual of transition. Uh, we also say it's not, we don't say it's unused space, but we say it's available space. Uh, we say it's not sustainable community, but it is a resilient community. Uh, in a way, I'm also talking about especially sustainability. I think it's a very important term that we have to think about and work like towards it, but it has been somehow co-opted by neoliberal discourse. So I think it's better to say resilient community. So somehow to define, to define your own language and to stand behind it. So ritual of transition was the moment or the day, it was a Saturday when the community and us uh, cleaned the park, which was a dumping ground for 40 years and we cleaned it in four hours, which was quite amazing. And uh, since we were there, there has not been dumping um, of the lot. Performative action, as part of the uh, opening of the Ubuntu Park, we organized the Soviet Street Festival. And uh, I just want to, to say where the community participated. And what was very interesting was that uh, I suddenly understood, for me, I understood the power of uh, performative actions and let's say a parade uh, because suddenly the community that didn't exist there was let's say no community as they say but suddenly during this uh, parade they were able to see themselves as a functioning and very powerful community and they were not only actors in the parade but they were also uh, uh, sort of a political actors in in the let's say in the political space of the city uh, act of naming, uh, what we are looking at is um, Paulina. Paulina was uh, the head of the kindergarten uh, that bordered on the space, uh, on this Ubuntu part. And uh, she came, she, she named, she, she came up the stage and she put a name on the park. She said, this is Ubuntu park, before it was hell and now it's paradise. So I thought, oh my God, it's so beautiful, what does it mean? And then it was very easy to understand what it means. Uh, the hell meant this, uh, like, not being uh, active, actually to be in some kind of paralysis. Uh, we caught it, uh, it's like these, these people are living like in the waiting, the Beckett's clay, waiting for Godot. So instead of paralysis uh, and inaction, uh, the paradise is when the community takes decisions in their own hands and they can do something themselves. So from inaction to action. Uh, Ubuntu Park means, uh, we see also think that uh, the name is, naming is very important, something similar to what uh, a little bit like Matthias was talking about yesterday. 
Um, Ubuntu party, Ubuntu means, uh, if I read this quote here from one guy who was uh, working with us, it says, the people is the people because of other people. Uh, for us it was uh, very important that sort of the, these traditional South African values, which are about sharing and not about in individualism, uh, somehow came up into the name. So we also have to understand that Suito today is very, uh, let's say, individualistically oriented. Everyone has a car and everyone wants to shop in big malls. So then the community chose the name that referred to the traditional South African values for the future of their community. Placemaking is another word that we are using uh, during the, like, the time of the working with the class, I realized that uh, the sociologists use the name of placemaking and what they want to say is that any, uh, any group that wants to get recognized in the society needs a physical space. Uh, so what I'm trying also to say is that in times when we talk about digital spaces and also uh, about uh, abstracted abstractions, spaces of abstraction such as public and private space, which many times we don't know what it is and how we can work in it, we suddenly are reminded that physical space matters. So, so the the platform which we built in the in the uh, Ubuntu part was somehow a representation of the the placemaking for the community, the power of placemaking. And uh, the, this is a completed platform. It's a, we call it a, a relational object. A relational object, a platform as a relational object is an object that builds relationships within the community and actually represents afterwards uh, the power of the project. Um, this is a diagram which I made uh, to explain to myself and to, to the class uh, what is a relational object. And uh, whenever, you know, sometimes we are asked, is this art or what is important? Is, is art important? I say art is not important, the important is culture. Uh, because art depends on culture. So this is culture, this is art. Art depends on culture. And if art is a relational object, it's also a tool to change culture. Uh, I personally believe that uh, contemporary culture and contemporary art should be uh, reflect each other, so it's important uh, that people understand it, people that we are not, like Maya was talking yesterday about this sort of uh, superficial art that people don't understand. I think it's very important that art is accessible to people and they can be a part of it. Uh, also, of course, the role of artist or designer for that matter changes, so we don't consider ourselves as being these uh, super authors, but we are uh, working in collaborations, we are co-authors, and also in this particular case, we are also mediators between community and, uh, um, let's say, the, the city. And, yeah. Um, okay, so, just like I have, I think, three more slides to go. Um, we didn't actually understand why the project was successful until, uh, till, until the very end. When there was a woman who was evaluator, she came. Uh, we were actually the project was very well organized, so we also got evaluators. There were evaluators coming to Suito at the end of the project, asking about uh, what we have learned and what the community have learned. Somehow to also understand if we really worked in horizontal way and if the knowledge was not imposed, but it was horizontally transmitted between uh, us and uh, community. And uh, then we realized that actually for uh, black Africans, uh, public space is a trauma uh, because they have been excluded from public space and public sphere during time of apartheid. And uh, so they couldn't, you know, sit on a bench, like here you see two guys sitting on a bench which says for Europeans only. Uh, the bench is now uh, located at the Museum for Apartheid, I think, Apartheid Museum. And uh, so they were not uh, allowed to sit on benches in public spaces, space, but also they were not allowed to vote. So what for me is very interesting is that the laws has been internalized. 
And this is why 40 years out, or 20 years after apartheid has ended, and actually they are politically in power, uh, they still trash their own public spaces. Which, uh, and this is just a, a photo from a newspaper, which, uh, so it's not a good to park that used to be only trashing ground, it was everywhere, public space was trashed. And uh, this is how we came into the, to work into, like, started to think about safety and violence, and we also realized that uh, a public space which is a uh, trashing ground is actually also an indicator uh, that uh, public space doesn't work, and basically what we are saying is that public space is a social agreement. Or if you want to have it the other way around, uh, so social agreement, without a social agreement there is no public space. Uh, this photo shows um, a barbecue stand, which we built, we built three barbecue stands in, in the Ubuntu Park, but no one use them. And why didn't they use them? Because uh, be, because they didn't understand that, like we didn't understand that they have no idea that if I make my food at, the, at this barbecue stand, it's for me and my family. Uh, people thought that it's for everyone, so everyone would come and eat the lunch. And I thought this was sort of a beautiful uh, explanation to us that we also, when we work in other countries, we have these sort of uh, ideas that actually don't hold for the for the people who are there. So we, this was actually a great example to to see that there was no public agreement about public space, and this also means that it needs to be reconstructed from scratch. So there was no idea of semi-public space or semi-private space that we just take for granted. I think this was a great lesson for us. And uh, just uh, this is just shows a, a photo of a string. We tried to figure out the construction of the roof, and then we left the string uh, on these poles uh, during the night. Okay, in the morning, there was no string anymore, so everything was stolen. So also we were we were told not to use any metal because it would be gone by, by the next morning not to leave any building blocks on the side if they would be gone. So in a way this, this sort of string was just a very, uh, a, again a reminder that public space is always a space of negotiation. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's the end. It's uh, Paulina again sitting on a bench. Uh, when we were asked what we have learned, uh, I think for myself I know, uh, that we have learned uh, an important way, a different way of working. Uh, we were, we are actually coming from Europe. We were acting as a linear thinker, so like working, uh, like, like you know, following the deadline, a step toward the deadline. But they, these guys were all the time rerouting the process, and they make it a very, like the process in a very intuitive way. And uh, I realized after I left that this intuitive process is actually as equally important as this linear thinking that we think is the best. And they were talking a lot about that they have learned that there is a future, basically that, that it's not only living for today, but actually you have to build up space for community for the future. Yeah, I think that's it. That's it. Yes. Okay. <laughs>
invite you to do the project? Um, are they still getting sustainable because of the collaboration with the municipality or the lack of collaboration with the municipality? Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, it depends actually, uh, it's uh, kind of different for every project that we do with the class who we are invited by. Um, sometimes it's art institutions, this time it was an um, association from Berlin. And um, this association from Berlin had the plan that we work together with an NGO in Soweto, uh, which in the end, I mean, they plan for us where we can stay and who we can meet and so on, but in the end we didn't work together with this NGO at all. They, uh, we're not uh, very cooperative w uh, with us, if I can say so, but we were just working together with the, uh, I mean, we were uh, living uh, really close to the space, so like with the people who we were living with, with their friends and so on, and I think for the Soveto project it was really what made it um, sustainable. Uh, yeah. I, I also think that, okay, nice. So uh, this is actually a very good question because uh, like people who supported us before we started to work, uh, like the Gate Institute and GI GIS, after we they saw what we did and, uh, after the project, they said this is nothing. Uh, at the same time, uh, we got very closely uh, close together with MMC, which is an institution within the government of Johannesburg, and it's called members of mayor's committee, MMC, and these guys, the, the, you have to understand that uh, the government institutions are totally corrupted, nothing works. For instance, you leave trash, but then people come and take the trash away, if they come, maybe they are not there one month. So it's, it's a real problem. We, we thought that uh, governmental agencies are very corrupted and how they, they, it doesn't, doesn't work, it's really something. Crazy. But at the same time, uh, the mayor sees the problem and he, he built this institution, a parallel government, within the government. And they came and looked at our project and uh, we, we had presentations back and forth and they said, this is exactly what the city would need. Mm. And uh, because we need social projects, as they call them, to call these projects social projects, to get uh, community organized. Because of course, these kinds of projects, as community gardens, it's not only working on something, but it's also getting self-organized, and then you build a committee, and you try to uh, figure out how to get new partners on board. Like when we left, there was another committee which they elected, which was called Environ uh, Ubuntu Park, something like uh, a project, and it actually tried to find partners beyond the Soviet community. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, the question is about uh, trust and collaboration, and it says after many years of apartheid rule. Uh, a group of white people arrives to organize a black community, and how did that work, and did they see you as patrons, or patronizing, or... Um, or how did that work? Um, well, first of all, um, because we were coming as white people into a black community, um, I mean, what I just experienced personally, people were like proud to have like white people there somehow. Uh, they were like um, the the woman we were living with. She was for one week showing us around the neighborhood to all of her friends, saying like, these are my friends, they came all the way from Germany, and then we got invited for some tea and we got into a conversation. So people, uh, from what I personally experienced, were like happy that we were there, and they had really weird expectations to us. They thought we were some sort of engineers, uh, or they definitely thought we were people with a lot of money that would come and build something fantastic, like 
they were thinking uh, about segways and things like that to move around in the neighborhood. And uh, this relationship uh, then developed in the course uh, of the project uh, for me personally to uh, very like day-to-day uh, -day, uh, thing. I mean, I just went for two months uh, every morning at eight o'clock to this uh, plot and then uh, I started mixing cement and like putting bricks over each other and a uh, big part uh, for me of the project was digging holes. The soil is very uh, hard, maybe like it is here. And uh, I mean, uh, this made it kind of a, a very different exchange than between me and the uh, people that were living there. So uh, we were kind of the same, you know, we had a shovel and we were digging a hole and we all were, had this kind of vision of uh, we all thought, okay, maybe this place is nicer if uh, there would be a bench to sit on and there would be a stage where the kids could play their music shows and so on. That's kind of my personal take. Uh, yeah, you actually touched something which also these uh, members of Mayor's Committee were talking about. Uh, what is the biggest problem is the dependence. Uh, people in Soweto, they depend on the state. And it actually trickled down from the state of apartheid to the new NAC government, which is actually again giving handouts instead of. Uh, so they are still the state is still uh, uh, giving things to people instead of working with people. You know, so what I said at the beginning, it's not. They don't say it's not our project; it's your project. They are just uh, somehow the state is still continuing the old uh, patronizing uh, role of the state, which existed existed before uh, during time of apartheid. Uh, you opened up. There was also. Sorry. Yeah, I want to ask about. <laughs> I want to ask about the relational objects that you mentioned, the new vocabulary. How do you identify them? What are the ca ca characteristics of them? You watch, you, you look around, and what is the process of, of saying, I will do the platform? This is a relational object. What is the met method methodology? Met 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 <laughs> And uh, how do you build it? Uh, so for the, I mean, it's always different. Uh, these uh, relational objects are always different, and they all also always come about differently. Uh, for the Soviet project, it was, uh, it's not that we like think about a relational object and then we implant it. It's kind of, uh, mostly it's like we look back and then uh, we give this thing that, uh, uh, came about the name, like it's kind of afterwards to make sense of what is happening. So uh, for the process of why there was a stage, um, the people, the way that they uh, like to, or in the community, the way that they like to organize was this uh, community meetings and committee meetings and so on. This is kind of the way that they uh, uh, were maybe used to organize themselves. So we were also having these uh, meetings. Uh, you saw one picture of all of us on this plot and then we were also meeting in uh, some office and maybe 30, 50 people or so came and we had like uh, workshops of what kind of things could um, be developed there and people were saying their ideas and then um, they were, uh, I'm not sure if they were voted for or if people just said, okay, so I want to help building this and that and uh, then we started to do it. Yeah, I, I think the, 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 the big, like, okay, there is a difference between object making and thinking about relational object. And again, it's very simple. If you just think about designing an object, you think about spatial and uh, spatial conditions. And you think that, uh, uh, okay, so if you think on another side about relational object, you think about people. So people are integrated part of, uh, of the becoming of an object. Is this okay? Yeah. Um, I thought you opened up a very interesting uh, spectrum before when you were mentioning um, this uh, intuitive thinking process. 
and uh, where Finn was mentioning uh, the plan without the program. And I think it's an interesting program that also relates to a lot of the discussions we're having here at the center and why you find kind of a, a, an affinity to the way that the center is going to develop in the next year. And maybe we can invite a comment from Maya or Ila about this kind of process where intuitive thinking, um, like Tietze was kind of uh, pointing out, is uh, stopping with the linear thinking or stopping with this logical Western way of uh, thinking and then allowing kind of uh, outliers, I think you call them, uh, to kind of cut off the process and take it in different directions. Whereas a plan without a program, I think, is more really um, creating the space and then not having any kind of information uh, format except for any kind of uh, impulse that comes from the outside. I think it's a interesting spectrum that is kind of taken away from uh, working either with a program or in a linear way. Uh, in a way, also, this the idea of no progr program is uh, the fact that uh, we, I think it's important not to stage the program, but you work with what is already there. So wherever you work, you don't work in Tabula Rasa environment. There are things that are there that make the program. Uh, I'm not sure what is the question, but uh, maybe say Mike can uh, say something. Huh? Say something. <laughs> okay. Intuitively. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think uh, for me it's like uh, um, I don't know. I think it's more like to to make uh, like to build for yourself this kind of tools, this kind of bricks. I don't know. It can be like. Uh, uh, physically or um, mentally and then it's like this kind of um, like uh, I don't know I mean it's in a way I mean it's not like really open because when it's really really open then I don't know sometimes stuff is not really happening but then you have to start with something and then the question is what you start with and uh, yeah I don't know if this was the question but uh, <laughs> yeah, but then you know, once you have like tools and you have like different things, so you can uh, do whatever you want to, and I think that's the the most fun uh, place. That you can do whatever you want, and like uh, you don't have, uh, yeah, you can do whatever. Uh, you're free to do. I mean, I think in a way that's what's nice about doing things with other people. For me, uh, I think it's. Uh, I mean, then you don't need to think. And uh, I mean, you separate kind of this idea of thinking and making, and you just um, do the more intuitional part. And I think it's very, I mean, that's what's missing in the world in general. Why? I think I also said something about it yesterday about that something feels right and I think it's because we, we are here a lot and I think you also mentioned it, the fact that you're just you're staying in a place and to, to be in a place and you, and then you start making everything kind of make sense because it, it's things you need and then it becomes very natural and not forced upon and I think also this idea of um, I think that uh, you mentioned about the language and about and and about that the language is kind of corrupted by neoliberalism and I think to do the same thing to neoliberalism because they always talk about this is the natural process and there's no other there's no alternative this is the way to act things must be productive and productive is, is good and then to think not no we are do doing things naturally and we are the natural I don't know maybe it's just a thought but I think yeah I think this whole thing is is on, on one level very fun and intuitive and, and, and maybe even uh, considered to be easy in a way or, or um, maybe fun is the, the best word but on the other hand I do feel like it has this power of maybe that's the fun that it has this power of, of rebuilding of rebuilding community rebuilding um, a place for yourself rebu rebuilding your own activity 
and your own uh, um, influence. And I think this is very, yeah, this is great. <laughs> Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, the spectrum in relation to what you asked. Uh, I don't know your name, but you asked uh, the uh, question about the reception, how you uh, and about the reception. And I think the approach, uh, having this intuitive approach, being able to kind of um, accept whatever comes at you and uh, insert it into the process. I think it also has to do a lot with the way that uh, everything you bring with you is rece recepted by whoever you bring it uh, with. Um, I think we have to finish here. So uh, maybe you want to make the final statement and not me, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, maybe we should say something which didn't, we didn't say at the beginning, that we are super happy to be here for this conference and also to be able to understand uh, more the, the uh, what the Digital Art Center is doing, and we are super enthusiastic. And uh, for us, it's for us it's a very important experience. Also, we've been uh, very uh, like a, like it was great to work with the students of architecture from Bezalel in Jerusalem. We worked uh, here for one week or so and uh, also with, with the group of the kids that are around here we created some objects that you can see some relational objects i hope that you can see around the building thank you we're happy you're here